morning, and welcome to the panel on the convergence of uh, payments and identity. We may still have a few folks drifting in, but uh, as we have a lot of content, we will aim to get going. My name is Almas Litas. I'm the CEO of Nstream. For those unfamiliar with Nstream, it's a joint venture of Bell, Telus, and Rogers, set up a number of years ago to help facilitate uh, the use of mobile network assets to enable transactions and authenticate uh, identity over mobile devices. We're in business now for about 14 years, making us, I believe, the longest running telco joint venture on the planet. But that's a bit like saying you're the best, you're the best restaurant at the hospital. Um, so before we begin, cast your mind back to an era before GPS and imagine two travelers going down a road in Ireland looking for Kilkenny. They turn left, they turn right, they're lost. <laughs> Finally, they find a gentleman strolling down the road and they ask him, can you tell us the best way to get to Kilkenny? And he says, well, if you really want the best way, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> and that's a little bit like our discussion on the payments uh, and identity convergence. We can imagine a world where there's convenient and secure confirmation of identity across all manner of channels. But the fact is we're starting from a place where we have cards, paper credentials, usernames, passwords, uh, the combination of which is neither really that convenient or that secure. And it's the getting from here to there that will be the trick. Fortunately, on the panel today, we have the three best guides in the nation to talk to us about that journey. Christian Ali is the country manager for Canada at Intersec, the push-based authentication and mobile app security company. In over 20 years in payments and digital identity as an executive of Dream Payments, SecureKey, and Endstream, he comes to us with a track record of a variety of innovations. Pierre Auberge is an advisor at Prodigy Ventures, also with over 20 years of experience in digital identity, identity digital currency, online and mobile payment marketplaces. Pierre helped found SecureKey Technologies, Dexit, and my favorite, Rocket Piggy. <laughs> Prior to joining Prodigy, Pierre helped guide clients such as TD Canada Trust, the Royal Canadian Mint, Interact, Endstream, SureTap, uh, the list goes on. Pierre is an advocate for new technologies and, when not out sailing, supports the innovation community as a fintech advisor to the Mars Innovation Center. And finally, to my left, Greg Wolfond is the founder and CEO at SecureKey, brings more than 30 years of experience in fintech security and mobile solutions. A serial entrepreneur whose earlier ventures include Footprint Software and 724 Solutions, a number of accomplishments, including being recognized as the Entrepreneur of the Year and one of the top 100 leaders in identity. It occurs to me collectively there are over 100 years of related experience <laughs> in payments and identity on the stage. Uh, so we heard yesterday about the importance of identity and the uh, role it plays in the evolution of payments. Uh, that uh, we heard one report that in a number of years, uh, the financial institutions expect over 90% of the interactions between their customers and themselves coming over uh, digital channels and specifically mobile devices. And the role of identity is going to be very important in this especially since we also understand that uh, mobile account takeover attempts have gone up at U.S. banks over 200% in just two quarters. 2018, fraud in person-to-person -person transactions is growing at a compound rate of 23%. And the last reported year for which there are numbers, there are about 7 million Americans who were victims of identity theft. So figuring out how to address these problems and help advance us down this path to the place that we want to get to is going to be a challenge. And as I said, uh, nowhere do we have a better uh, panel of guides to help us get there than uh, here on this stage. So the format for this morning is uh, I'm going to sit down now and allow the panelists a few moments to introduce their perspectives on this topic. And then we'll have a question and answer period. I'll lead questions, but of course, invite questions from the audience to keep us moving. So I'd like to start with uh, Christian to talk to us, oh, start with Pierre, <laughs> um, to talk to us about the global perspective on uh, identity. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, thank you all, Miss. Very good. Um, I realize it's 8.30. I realize this is the first presentation for today. Uh, but allow me to start with few concepts and few definitions so we can level set and start from there. So what is a digital ID? A digital ID is a set of attribute or claim one make about himself or make about somebody else. A claim can be subject to an evaluation by the party depending on it. That's what we call, uh, that's what we call digital authentication. This isn't my way. I claim that my name is Pierre Roberge, but most of my claim are not about my name. I claim that I am Canadian, I'm over 19, that I'm licensed to drive. While no business can claim that they own me, some business owns some of my ID. Uh, Google owns my Gmail account. LinkedIn owns the URL for my uh, LinkedIn profile. Um, Sometimes a claim can be authenticated between two parties. If I want to demonstrate to you I'm over 19, I could end over my driver's license. Uh, Sometimes there are three-party transactions. If I want to present to a lender that my credit score is over 700, uh, we would have a three-party transaction. The World Bank report has reported that 161 countries in the world are, have an ID system that's using digital ID. Yet, global identification is a challenge for many of them. One billion people lack any proof of, of identity. One in two women in low-income countries do not have any ID, preventing their uh, access to critical services and participation in the economic and economical life. Let's discuss a few examples about digital ID deployment around the world. No one size fit all. There is localized recipe give for different flavor of privacy, transparency, use, and reach. Um, one of the, one of the, one of the countries that many of you will have heard about is about Estonia, and its goal to raise their economic uh, profile status and modernize their infrastructure. They launched a smart card based national ID card back in 2002. The ID card can be used for online authentication and digital signature. With a population of 1.3 million citizens, the government-run EID program is mandatory for any citizen over 15 years of age. It is now available and it's now used in 99% of the public services uh, online. Their operating model is where every single interaction of a citizen with the administration is linked to a single identifier verified by the state. To equalize the balance of power between, uh, between the citizen, uh, they have access to their profile and they can see at any time who's accessing their information. That's meant to be a way to prevent, uh, to detect some fraud. Uh, this is a good example of a digital ID system that is prioritizing transparency over uh, privacy. Some digital ID are born to uh, combat identity fraud online. One such example is in the UK with UK Verify, an online authentication service for government use only. In Asia, to facilitate proof of residency, the Indian government has created the world's largest biometric ID database in the world. More than a billion people have provided their biometric data to the government national database in exchange of a digital ID number. HADHAR, the name of the program, was initially started as a voluntary program to combat uh, benefit fraud. It is, it is now being used to get access to government service online and by the private sector for KYC, know your customer activity from such of bank, uh, bank and telco. Moving to Africa, we can look at Nigeria, a government-led EID program, a government uh, EID card program, where the goal of the program was to bring financial inclusion to all. So what did they do? They've combined biometric and an EMV application into that, that card in a payment uh, partnership, in a public sector partnership with MasterCard. There's also some example of private sector-led or technology-led initiative. Uh, one such example is Mobile Connect, a GSMA-led global standard for mobile operator who wants to facilitate digital ID system. As a way of reference, GSMA is the organization that makes our phone works everywhere we go in the world, so a, a very important organization. Here at home, there's increasing number of options available. Canada is unique in the world in its, in its public-private sector quest for digital ID. Through the digital authentication count, uh, the through the Digital Authentication Council of Canada, 
Leadership, or DIAC, the public and the private sector are working together to drive economic benefit to all while prioritizing privacy, security, and convenience. Uh, there's no deny of a strong commitment from privacy, for privacy over transparency. Example of solution available to Canadian is from Secure Key Technology uh, with Concierge and more, more recently Verified.me, delivering a network facilitated exchange of digital asset between ID provider and asset consumer. Greg will tell us more about this in less technical term. Uh, looking forward. Are you saying I'm not technical? Did it say that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> is, is your PowerPoint working still? Okay. Uh, looking forward, what are the benefits to consumer and retailers? Uh, digital ID paves the way to trusted access, authentication, and privacy. For consumer, it's increased power uh, on the use of your data. It's increased improved privacy. For retailer, digital ID promised to increase data quality, uh, best practices, and solution to manage the increasingly toxic, personally identifiable information, or PII. Um, quick parenthesis here, I think PII is the new <coughs> PCI, so keep an eye on that. Uh, digital ID for retailer hold the promise to streamline the check-in process uh, and reduce cart abandonment. Uh, it's also a more robust way to sell product with eligibility requirement, uh, such as alcohol or other restricted good. For all of you starting to think about what does it mean to adopt digital ID in your business, I have one advice for you. Put consumer at the center. Control. Giving control to the user about their data will deepen the engagement. Speed. Slow process or barrier to adoption. Security. Protection of the data when it is captured, when it is in transit, when it is at rest, is important. Trust. Everybody needs to be aware of the risk. And finally, uh, transparency. What is the information that's required? Why is it required? And what's the exchange of value? Why do I need to give you my information and what I get in return? Uh, the consequences for the exchange of value needs to be clear for all the participants. Um, my takeaway for you, uh, first thing, consent. Consent is the foundation for a strong consumer-centric model. Consent is more than a checkbox. Consent is more than a one-time activity. Consent is establishing the relationship between two parties. Who's dealing with who? What is the right of access, the right, uh, the right of correction, the right of erasure, data portability? Second, get familiar with privacy by design. It's an approach for data protection into system engineering that has been foundational for a number of digital ID program around the world. Uh, get ready to talk about consent. Get familiar with the, the concept of consent, identity, authentication, and authorization. And finally, get involved with the DIAC and get familiar with the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework. It's designed to promote uh, transition to a fully digital ecosystem that benefit all Canadian and businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. And now, Christian, on the technical aspects of enabling identity. Not, not that technical, but. <laughs> so, you know, you don't really realize how ver ver verbose you are until they slap a timer on you and say you have like six minutes. So, um, Pierre, that was great. I think uh, what we're going to contribute to, or what I'm going to contribute to next, ties in very nicely. So, for those of you who don't know Intersect, um, we're an international technology company. Uh, we actually were the first to implement out-of-band authentication across a mobile channel about 12 years ago. And since then, we've, we've evolved our technology to help organizations uh, digitize their or go through a digital transformation by focusing on the mobile side of things and the online channel. So what we do is we bind a digital identity with a mobile device, and then we allow those organizations to leverage that technology and uh, accelerate their transformation. So we have a global perspective on things, and that's, that's kind of what I'm going to share with you today. So if you take a look at this picture, um, this was back in 2005. It was the announcement <clears throat> of Pope Benedict the 16th, right? I don't know if you guys have ever seen this picture. I mean, fast forward, it's 2013, <laughs> okay? 
Now, if I go back and you look at the bottom right, you see an early adopter down there. Was Greg. That was Greg, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. So, you know, from our perspective, actually, let me go back a bit. We have, uh, we're in about 50 different countries. We have over 100 million devices on our platform, and we're onboarding about a million active users monthly. So with that, uh, one thing I'll tell you is that um, within every region, there are nuances, customer expectations that are unique to that region, right? What we expect and what we experience in Canada is a bit different than the Europe and the UK, but those are starting to change. Um, if you, you look back at how we used to compare products in the past, we used to look at, you know, Tide versus Game, right? Pepsi versus Coke. We used to judge things or rate things, products and services, based on the categories they belonged in. But that's changed quite a bit. It's changed quite a bit. The ease with which you can access services such as Uber and Amazon on your mobile device means that we now expect the same experiences from our financial institutions and anybody else that's um, servicing us. So that's why you hear things like an Uber-like experience. Right? It's, it's an overall perspective. We rely on our devices more today than we did last year and five years before that. And next year, we're going to be relying on them even more, right? Connected cars, connected homes. Um, the more that we travel and work remotely, the more we depend on those devices. And historically, we've all in this room been, have been focusing on a frictionless user experience, right? trying not to involve the customer as much as possible, right? If we have to reach out to the customer, don't do that. But the reality is, that was great. Uh, we kind of expected that as consumers in North America until the mega breaches started to occur, right? So last year, over 5 billion records were exposed across about 6,500 breaches, which is pretty bad, right? 5 billion. But actually, it's an improvement. It's about 36% less than the 8 billion that were exposed the year before. So you know, when you look at that context or take that into consideration, consumers today are a lot different than we used to be. Right? We're less trusting. That's reality. We trusted these organizations to manage this stuff, automate things, and just, you know, I don't have to worry about it. So we've, we've been looking at this from a global perspective, and we've done surveys. And the reality is that 90% of people surveyed, at least in UK and, and North America, have said that they actually want to participate. Right? They want to authorize either all or some of their transactions, banking transactions, from their mobile devices. So it's no longer just a frictionless experience. It's a friendly friction experience. Right, and putting control back into the consumer's hands. So again, what I was saying is that the gap is actually closing. Consumers today demand services according to their individual preferences, whenever, however, wherever they are. Right. So that takes us to Capitec Bank. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this, but Capitec Bank is a South African bank. They're voted the number one bank in the world by the Lafferty global ranking um, for about two years, and then they slipped down to three subsequently. But over the last several years, they've been in the top three. Um, that survey goes beyond just financial comparisons. They factor in qualitative measures such as strategy, culture, living the brand, digital enablement, uh, management experience, and customer satisfaction. So they take a holistic view at these organizations, at the banks, across about 50 different countries. and rank them. By all intents and purposes, or by all comparisons, I should say, Capitec is a young organization. They were founded in 2001 in South Africa. They have about 500 branches across the world. And their philosophy really is not complicated. It's, they, they, they really strive to deliver on their belief that banking should be simple, affordable, and transparent. <laughs> their slogan is, bank better, live better. We help you manage your financial life better so you can live better. So a big part of what they focus on is providing financial literacy, which, as you can imagine, uh, some regions require more than others. And I would suggest that North America, <laughs> we need it uh, severely right now. 
They had a vision to enable all of their services on the digital channel. It was a quite aggressive um, strategy, but they had a cohesive strategy. And we engaged with them early 2012 uh, on an innovation transformation uh, journey, which ultimately increased their customer confidence in the mobile channel and drove significant transactional growth in that, in that channel. The results were pretty impressive. They, um, they grew from 2% in 2007 to 25% of the market in 2017, within 10 years, okay? Uh, their client base more than doubled from 2012 to 2017 to about 11.3 million customers. And they, uh, their remote transactions, remote banking transaction increased by about 50% year over year. So they started seeing that, trend, that, that uh, growth. But guess what? Really cool thing about this solution was that they have zero fraud on their digital channel. Absolutely zero. And this is based on um, the, the president's report or the CEO report from Capitec Bank. So, and there are other organizations within this market that are doing that. So they were so digitally effective that they were able to start providing more in-branch services across the digital channel. And in fact, <laughs> believe it or not, they were actually able to lower uh, or reduce their fees, which was a, a huge win for the consumers, at least that's how they saw it. And recently, they've launched a cashless, um, cashless wallet or cashless payment at retailers. So you can actually use your mobile banking app and pay at a retailer or pay at a service provider. And they use QR codes, they use contactless, they use a number of different technologies. <laughs> so a strong digital identity is really the basis of this, okay? A trusted identity. Um, and when you, you really have a really great digital identity strategy, it demonstrates that you can transform an organization and in fact, entire uh, market. So each region of the world is gonna have a different approach. We recognize that. We're not purporting that all aspects of what Capitec did is actually a good fit or suitable for Canada. But it does demonstrate the, cons the, the benefits to the consumers and the banks when you get digital identity right. So Capitech secured their mobile and online channel. They eliminated fraud on that channel. They experienced hard dollar savings. They improved their customer experience. They established a competitive advantage with they which they continue to, to maintain. They reduced their fees. And now that what they're doing is continuing to enable newer use cases. So if you look at an organization like Capitech Bank and what they've done, and you look at all the great things that we're actually doing in Canada, and I think Greg's gonna talk a bit about some of that, I believe as leaders in this space, we can do just as well or even better. So that's it for me today. Thanks. Thank you, and with that then, yeah. Greg will Thanks. take it home and uh, tell us about what's going on in Canada. I don't know how to make this go. Is this working? You did it. I couldn't believe that picture about the, the inauguration stuff with the phones and not having the phones. So a lot of you have heard me speak about this a bit, like where identity is going, and we're going to talk about it a bit in the panel. Uh, I'm going to try to be quick, and I'm going to try and give you a demonstration of the verified service that launched, because what does that mean? It's hard to really fathom it. So I had one funny slide that Daryl McMullen uh, showed yesterday that I loved. And, as a young child, my mother told me I can be anyone I want to be. It turns out that's identity theft. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all these folks are talking, right? They're basically saying this thing is broken. This thing about identity, calling a call center to prove who you are, when the bad guys are getting all your records and they can answer your questions better than you. The articles on the front page of the paper that talk about um, 16 million calls to the government, of which more than half go unanswered because you can't answer your questions or get through on things, this doesn't work. Showing up in person and what was it, 20 some percent increase of in-person fraud. Anyone who has a kid knows your driver's license. It's very easy to make a fake driver's license. And for all the power of this technology today, saying I can take a picture of my driver's license, match the face, and therefore it's me, it's a plastic document that the bad guys can manufacture at will. One factor like that is not gonna be strong enough to solve the in-person, online, and the rest. So our, our message is really about this, this is not working, right? Call center stuff doesn't work. Anybody here use WhatsApp? They're tracking all your location. They're seeing all your messages. So as of yesterday, it's hacked. And it's getting everything about you. So we just are not safe with these single factor kind of mechanisms and what people are doing. Um, 
around them and the kind of hacks that are happening to things like Yahoo and Dropbox and all the rest of that. And at this point I'll make clear, when we talk about identity, you have to be an ecosystem, but one factor doesn't work. The, the scenario that um, Pierre talked about in India where I can take a fingerprint and I put my finger on the sensor, what did I do there? Uh, and therefore they know that it's me, the bad guys are able to lift your fingerprint off Facebook pictures, make a fingerprint, put it on the sensor, and then become you, mm -hmm. which is not a good thing. Like one factor solutions do not work. You need multi-factor to work. So our, our real message for Canada as we build this ecosystem and we need lots of parts from lots of players is one factor doesn't work and no one entity has the best of all these factors. So we're going to need this what I know factor, like a strong password from your bank, log into your bank where they know it's you. We're going to need a what I have, like do I have the cell phone? Sorry. Do I have Greg Wolf on cell phone uh, with me and then I know that it's actually Greg? And we're going to need a, um, a biometrics at some point. Do I match the driver's license? Can I use the face? Uh, and all the rest of that. So how do we bring all this stuff together is the trick. And that's what the verified me stuff is supposed to do that we just launched. I don't know what's going on with that. I'm trying to make sure everyone's awake and so I'm blinking. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry. This is not part of the demo. Okay. So verified me that launched just now. The whole, the whole idea of verified, if you can see it between the flashes. <laughs> is it's supposed to be an identity that's portable with you that has this strong security of what I have, what I know, what I am. Really? Stop that. <laughs> um, that I can take when I go to government, that I can take when I go to healthcare, that I can take when I go to different services I use and prove that it's me and I'm the only one who sees that. I consent to sharing my data. No one else is tracking me and knowing where I'm going. And it just kind of works. Come on, really? Sorry. North Koreans tapping into your presentation. <laughs> this is really hilarious. Is there a connection problem there? Thanks. <laughs> this is what Pierre said, I'm not technical. <laughs> this is the help. OK. Can we freeze the? Help me. <laughs> Thanks. OK. So the general idea is, really? <laughs> Sign up Anyone now. know how to Sign do this better? Is there a pause? Are you guys doing stuff at the back? I don't know. OK. I surrender. OK, sorry. This is a new feature that I've never seen before. All right. It's a resolution. It's all anyway, you can get the, it's a resolution thing, you think? Yeah, it's a refresh. Keep going. OK, so Keep what going. if I don't do it this way? If I do it that way, is it going to be less? Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> You said I wasn't technical. The, the, <laughs> so the, the whole idea is it's supposed to be really easy, right? So how do I, in a secure way, share who I am? Show up at a bank in person, click a QR, share that it's me, share that Royal Bank says this is Greg Wolf on, that Roger says, yes, this person has Greg Wolf on's phone, that BC says, yes, Greg matched his driver's license on the device, and do it in a way that's really fast and efficient, but really strong security so they know what's actually me. And the, and the whole point is it's supposed to work. Now I'm making all my slides. Come on. It's supposed to work everywhere I go. So it's supposed to work when I show up at CRA. It's supposed to work when I want to go to a retail branch or I want to prove who I am at the post office, as an example, like we talked about before. How does that, how do we make that easier and not have the fake um, kind of identity stuff happening? So a good example of this is KYC. People talk about KYC all the time. I want to show up at a bank. I don't want to go in in person. Can I log in right now to Royal Bank and prove it's me when I'm going to another bank and have them share my name, my address, my date of birth, have the telco share that yes, I have Greg's phone, the SIM hasn't changed in a period of time, uh, you know, a great service that we have partnering with Endstream. Um, and can I have it, can I share also things like Equifax? Equifax says I'm a good person, I've got three, you know, three years of history, I've got multiple lines, and do that all in a simple transaction. So I'm gonna get off of this, I hope, and show you kind of an example of verified me, how this verified me stuff works. Really? So why is the screen flashing at everything? So this is just a test application that you're going to see blinking here regularly. Um, and I want to be able to share that data, but I don't know, has, has anyone downloaded Verified Me? Tried it? All right. So you can't see all the uses yet. So the whole point of this is you can go to it. If you have an account at Sun Life, you can see your Sun Life stuff. You can get a free credit score within your application. But what I wanted to show you was, um, let me start at the beginning here. I'm sorry. 
I wanted to show how I'd use this. So on this test application, which isn't blinking for the second, let's assume you're a bank or you're a credit union or you're a telco who just wants to know this is the person. Like if it's a telco, that person's going to pay 100 bucks and walk out with a $1,200 iPhone, which I still can't believe. It's an expensive iPhone. But um, what if we want to know who they are? So am I willing to share my bank profile from my bank and then I verified my mobile device is what I'll do in this test interface. And what should appear if that was an in-person transaction is um, a QR code on the screen. So how would I use that QR code on the screen, you might ask, and I'm going to try to show you here. This might work, might not work. Showing anything? So this is verified me. Um, and when I load Verified B, it connects to my bank. This is one of the bank accounts I have. So it, it calls out to your bank right away. It uses my face to identify me. So to be me, I have to be able to log on to my bank as me. I have to have Greg's phone. I have to have matched my face. And now I'm in Verified Me. I'm logged into Verified Me, and it checks to make sure it's me, and I can actually do things. So it'll tell you what you can do with the app. It'll show you in the things you can do where I can use it. You can go get your credit score. You can connect to your Sun Life accounts and see your credit score. My credit score is mucked up. Don't get a credit card with your son when he goes to school and have him not pay it. It'll destroy your credit. Uh, I learned that. Um, but you can also do things like take a picture of a QR. So if I click the camera in the corner of this and I take a picture of this QR, which is here, you'll see what happens is the screen processes and says, OK, we want to verify your number. So you consent to us checking your phone and making sure it's actually you, which hopefully works here. We have one bug in this area, so I'm see, making sure it works. So it says that's done. And now it asks me, hey, Greg, are you willing to share from TD Bank your name, your address, your date of birth, your email? And are you willing to share from your carrier, I think in this case, uh, Bell, your mobile device? And if I say agree, um, it basically goes to TD Bank, takes the data that I have and encrypts it. It goes to the telco site, takes the data I have and encrypts it. It's going to deliver that to the relying party, be it a bank. And it says, so it says encrypting, and then it says sending. Uh, and when it's done, it says done. I don't know what happens here. It says done. Um, but you can't see this. What happens at that relying party site is all my data is there. So please don't take over my ID and become me because I'm showing all my data on the screen. But generally, you can see here it says, I'm Greg Wolfon. I live at this address. Uh, this is my date of birth, this is my phone number, this is my email. And this came from my trusted bank. I authenticated with my bank, and they're willing to share this on my behalf. It came from the telco. I have the same phone number, and I'm on that mobile device from the telco. Very high assurance that it's Greg. We kind of go to the chip and pin world. Before chip and pin, we had Magstripe, tons of fraud. Chip and pin, I have Greg's phone, and I know Greg's pin. I can log into his bank. In this case, it used the face, but it can also use a um, uh, login there and lots of questions and all the security screening they have. I'm going to stop because this is blinking way too much for me. But you start to see the power of what this does for us consumers. Like I want to go get a new cell phone, or I want to sign up for a service in government, or I want to be able to uh, get a mortgage. And I can prove that the stuff that was exciting when I went to the beginning of this was you can see at the beginning, I don't know if you can see the screen if it's not blinking, my bank profile, my Equifax profile, telco device bundle, driver's license, background check, CRA profile, uh, address. Like CRA is not done, but we did a great pilot. You saw some news on it. It's amazing what it does for people when I can just share this data. Like imagine trying to apply for a mortgage where you can share um, that it's really me from a bank that I am already, and here's my income validation from CRA, and here's my credit report from Equifax in a single transaction for the consumer. And then the consumer can, I can show you on the device. I'm going to stop because it's blinking too much. All the transactions that I've done, all the places I've shared, the only one who can see that is me. The bank can't see or track me. The government can't see or track me. The party's providing data. Don't get to know where I'm going. The only one who gets to know is me. So, you know, think of this for my mom with health care. I take the app, she puts it in front of her face, she clicks the QR, and she logs in to see her records at UHN, which is the stuff we're working on. It's amazing what it's going to do for consumers to empower her to be able to use things and get things done with a high level of security. But this isn't going to work unless we have an ecosystem. It isn't going to work unless the government, telco, and banks all work together to do this. Like what Canada has as an advantage now is Canada's bringing together these parties to say, hey, we can actually solve this and do it in a way which is privacy respecting that you own your data, you consent to share it, uh, and has a huge level of security that's higher than what everyone else is thinking about, that all these together is what makes it really work. So pretty excited to be at this launch date, but lots more to come in this, in this space. Thank you very much. So 
a number of years ago when we were when the mobile payment <coughs> space was about where the discussion on identity is now there were three types of solutions in market there were proprietary solutions that were delivered by individual institutions by themselves there were some national solutions that were coalesced across organizations in individual countries and there were global proposals generally put forward by uh, global brands and technology companies. We seem to have those three types of options here on the identity space. Uh, is this the right characterization? How do you see the interplay across the three of them? And uh, where do you think the solution will emerge in Canada? And I'll start with Greg. Yeah, so we don't, this isn't going to be one company winning. This is going to be a fight among gorillas to set standards for where standards go, right? So Microsoft has a standard called Identity Hub that they're pushing pretty hard. There's a standard that W3C is now looking like they'll adopt in this thing called DIDs uh, that go there. And our view is all of this stuff has to interoperate. Like you'll see recently SecureKey joined this Aries Alliance that brings these things together. If a province wants to build an identity thing with its driver's license and wants to provide it as it did, it should interoperate with these networks. But at the end of the day, our belief is honestly almost for consumers, um, unless you get this level of security where I have all factors, it doesn't work. Like if you load a biometric, when I switch from one phone to another phone, how do I really know it's almost, what are the questions um, you know, a, a telco or others can ask me or a government could ask me in the city of Toronto to know that it's me, they don't have the questions to ask. Even my bank who knows me well when I'm trying to recover and go to a new device, the questions they typically ask, um, what was your first mortgage rate on your mortgage 25 years ago? When did you open the card? We don't know the answer to some of the questions. Like Tim Hockey used to joke uh, when his TD, if we have a customer on the phone and they can't answer the questions, it's probably our customer because the bad guy's got a database <laughs> flying through the answers. The, pr the problem is, unless you have all these things working together, I can match the driver's license, I can know that I have this mobile device and it's current and the SIM hasn't changed, unless you bring these things together, we're not going to get to the level of security that makes digital ID work. Um, so you need an interoperability to make that go. So our, our, our belief is they're going to get forced to work together, um, and we have to find a way in Canada to start from that mantra to say, hey, let's bring in the services that people have and let's make them work together, uh, and then we'll get to a better place. So DIAC is a great place to go with the DIAC standards. So Pierre, I mean, if we have to get everything to work together, is it best done on a national basis or will there be global operators who will bring everybody together? Um, so, uh, so standard is really important and that, that gives interoperability. I think the, uh, the, other, the, other, uh, the other angle I would look at is we cannot have, uh, we don't want to create more silos. We don't want a government system, a private sector system, a banking system, a telco system. That doesn't work. Um, in addition, it's, it creates um, uh, some have and have not. So if you're in a province that support digital ID and you can get some services, you can get access to some uh, 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 you know, quality of service, some services, and if you're in a different province, you don't have that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a parallel discussion to, uh, to our health system when we say we don't want a two-speed system. We want every Canadian to have access to the same service, the same quality. I think the digital ID, because it's so foundational to, to, uh, to the, or, or, or digital society, uh, we need the private and the public sector coming in and offer that a across the board. Mm -hmm. We cannot live with a, with a, you have an Android phone, you can be serviced, or you have an iPhone and you cannot be serviced. It needs to be available to all Canadian, and, and DIAC is working toward that to do this. If you add the layer of interoperability, uh, I think there's a, a real opportunity uh, to, to have something that works, uh, that, that will, that will create some bridge to, to other country and, and support uh, commerce worldwide. Christian, we have heard a strong kind of case for the one ecosystem to rule them all. Is this, uh, is this where we're going to end up? I think, you know, what we're going to see is it's much like payments, right? So you're going to find that there are certain payment solutions that are successful within regions. But then there are other schemes that are successful globally. And those didn't happen overnight, though, right? And with what's happening with exposures and breaches and the advancement of technology and, and consumer expectations that have a pull-through effect, right? Because technology and society kind of converge and, and pull business along with them. Uh, you're going to see changes in regulation that follow slowly. Um, but hopefully, we'll start to accelerate. So is it GDPR? and PSD2 and SCA, but GDPR, 
was only implemented or updated recently, right? The last time was in 1992 that governed the rules of engagement on this, this platform. So I think what's going to happen is, is, you know, Canada's very unique, right? We have a, a culture of collaboration, right? Six major banks, 88 financial institutions versus thousands in the U.S., uh, three major MNOs that converge to create an entity like Endstream, right? I remember years before we used to say, do you know who Endstream is? And I'm like, no, it's a joint venture by the three telcos. They'd say, what? <laughs> is that even possible? Um, so, you know, we've seen, we've seen collaboration work in the past. We're seeing it work again today. I think, though, there are going to be some global guidelines and standards, and there's going to be a unique flavor for, you, for every region. <laughs> there's, a, there's a really interesting point on that stuff with standards. Like, we can't build a Canada-only thing. That if you think about the challenge of moving money, I want to send money from my account at TD Bank or Royal Bank to my friend who happens to bank at Bank of America. The, the problem today is you can't do that. The regulations prohibit it because the sender bank has to know KYC AML on who I'm sending to, and the receiver bank has to know who did it come from. Was it a bad person? So we'll have later this year demonstrations with Canada and the US. I can prove it's actually Greg here from my bank, and I can send the data to my <coughs> correspondent bank in the States and prove who I am to be able to do that transaction where both can see the KYC AML parts. We've already done it with UK Verify that Pierre talked about before. We can come from UK Verify, come to Canada, prove this person is who they say they are. If you don't build this stuff to be interoperable globally, we're going to be an island, and you cannot build this stuff as an island. Like the, the problems that we have to solve about identity are not just Canada problems. They're, they're global, and we have to be able to solve those. And I, I also I think we need to recognize that Canada is a leader. Uh, uh, private sector and public sector working together, this is pretty unique. And our government does, uh, is, is anti-Big Brother. Uh, there's a lot of government uh, initiative out there where the government wants to know everything you're doing, or you would question why China is doing a particular thing or Russia is doing a particular thing. When the concierge was launched, it was important that, that, that privacy uh, uh, be respected. And the government didn't want to see the data because it knew it would slow down adoption and it was not a best practices. Um, uh, privacy by design was created in, 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 it w is, it, as strong supporter in, in Canada and this, the, there is this idea of, of, uh, that, uh, of full feature. It can be a win-win where we have privacy uh, that, that, that provide full service. And I think that, that uh, we're, we're, we're showing uh, a lot of the point, a lot of organization out there that it, it is possible to be done, and there's value in doing that. So uh, I think we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll continue to see some uh, taught leadership from 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 this country. So Greg mentioned an interesting point on global interoperability, Pierre, the public-private collaboration. Each of you has experience and suffers some of the scars <laughs> from trying to advance causes on an ecosystem type uh, basis. Pierre, can you comment on any other learnings as to what works or doesn't work when trying to get a group of potential competitors and cross-industry and cross-sector participants trying to work together on a single initiative? Um, that, that's a, that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, I, I think it depends on who's at the table. Um, I think that uh, if we can, I think there's generally uh, an agreement now to put the customer at the center and think about it in those terms. And I think it drives some of the discussion, or it will drive some of the what is the spirit that, uh, as a as a collective, we're trying to get to. Uh, I think if we can go back to the spirit of the agreement, I think that's one way where we're able to reconcile, uh, to make some decision or to make some trade-off. Uh, what what's important to the collective? What do we? What are we not ready to compromise? Canada is not ready to compromise on privacy. Compare with Estonia, which really wanted to do transparency, wanted to prevent fraud. And, and so I think it would be, uh, th those are some of the, some of the, uh, the, the line in the sand that those organizations have put, has put together. And, and then the group need to rally around this and, and you need to, to drink the Kool-Aid or, or, or move on. Christian, any, any scars you'd like to share with us? Lots. <laughs> um, I, I, I hate to make a Game of Thrones reference. Yeah. Right? I, I hate it. I don't want to be that guy. But think about it, right? Like, there's a common problem. There's a common threat. And either we approach it collectively and uh, succeed, or we're going to fail one by one. And yeah, maybe one guy's going to rise to the top. But if you look back to the uh, genesis of Interact, what was the problem? 
problem is too much paper in the ecosystem, right? Too much paper in the branches. I think it was 60% uh, paper, 30% digital. I can't remember the numbers exactly. And then this whole transition to start introducing acquiring and, and debit card machines and, and changing an ecosystem. We're now like a huge, we are one of the leaders in debit internationally, right? And we, we solve for a problem, chip and pin, we solve for a problem. Um, so again, it, we have proven points where these things have succeeded. Now, we also have a lot of failures in the market. I remember when we are all moving to, to chip and pin and spent a tremendous amount of time about the apps that we're gonna put on these, these chips on our cards and, and all the great things it's gonna do and then boom, overnight, mobile came in and changed everything, right? Changed everything. So, you know, we say it a lot, and, and it's, it's interesting that when we talk with different regions internationally about solutions and, and what works here, what doesn't work there, and a lot of times, the, it always reverts to the role and trust that citizens have with government. The operating model. The banks. Believe it the banks. Believe government. it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's not a technology. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, at the end of the day, though, we all, like every one of us reads these stories, right? You see WhatsApp gets hacked and they're knowing your location and knowing where you are. Um, you start seeing things like weather app. Like a hilarious point, I, w I was in uh, Europe cycling a couple weeks ago and I went to AccuWeather. So AccuWeather is the same here as there, but they have GDPR over there. So I launch AccuWeather and it says, hey, do you want to pay five pounds to see the weather or do you want to let us access your data and share your data? So you can click a link that says, show me where you're sharing my data. So I click the link, and the first page has 47 companies, and it got me down to the Bs. <laughs> and you can click on every company and say, okay, they're sharing my location, they're sharing where I am and when I am. They're making money, basically, on monetizing me. So the weather's free, but they're really making money on you. And I don't think people really know what they're sharing and when they're sharing. 100%. And there's this pendulum swing, almost, on this new world that says, I should be able to know what people are sharing about me. I don't necessarily want to share my location, but I can't understand in the terms of Facebook or these apps. What, what am I actually sharing and when? In fact, there's a lawsuit in the US against the Weather Network where people are saying, holy moly, I'm consenting to let you have my location and you're not telling me it's in the fine print on page 47 of the terms that you're gonna share my data with other providers to monetize it. It's, it's really hard for consumers to understand this. In things that are important like seeing my healthcare or other stuff, I don't want other people to know. I don't want my bank to know when I go to this health provider or that health provider. I don't want people to track me. And so this stuff has to be really clear. Like the consent, as much as the screen flashed, are you willing to share this data from TV Bank and this data from your telco with this provider for this purpose one time? Very, very clear. I can click on it, I can see the data I'm sharing. And if you don't consent, it doesn't get shared. And that's a better model. Like I love where Canada is going on this privacy model. So higher security, higher privacy. Because the other stuff, it's going to break. Like GDPR is breaking all that stuff that's happening in Europe right now, and some of that's going to make its way over here. But models that share everything or see all my data or take too much, I don't think that's where we want to be in Canada. So I'm sure we could continue on, but I'd also like to open the floor up to questions from the audience. And Lawrence. <coughs> Mark's not on? Okay. Oh, no, it's on. Um, two questions. Uh, first question is, why do we have to share any data at all? Couldn't we just provide a token to say I'm me and move on? So example, uh, going into a bar, I want to order something. All I have to do is <coughs> prove my that I'm over 19. I don't have to give them my address and my name or anything like that. So I think we shouldn't share any data at all. And if we can do a token that just says I have the, I'm, I'm allowed to buy alcohol, that should be sufficient. And yeah, it appear absolutely. kind of alluded to that, but it sounds like the Verify Me solution is actually giving your data. No, Sec no, no, it's, 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 so I just want to be clear. It's giving it, the data that you choose, but it's giving data. And you know, I'll, I'll give you a good example of this with Uber. Um, when you, when you, t you, you can uh, choose not to provide your location, in which case the app doesn't work at all. So it's kind <laughs> of like if you, don't, if you don't provide information, you can't have any of the service. So, so but, but isn't there a better way we would just provide a token? So let, let, let's, let's do a clarity thing, right? If I'm a telco, I have to have a system. The system has to have your name, your address, your email. I could type all that in, but at some point in time, Rogers, Bell, Telus need to have that in their system or it doesn't function. We could in some future state go to some centralized, this is the one database of all our identity and everyone trusts it, 
And then if I'm a bank, I kind of worry, hey, if someone changes Greg's address in the post office, I'm going to have fraud. That's kind of a tricky thing to get to. But the way Verified Me works is it's not give everything. If you're a bank and you're opening an account, you need this data so the bank is allowed to request this data. If you're a health provider, you may just need the health card number to do it. If you're a bar, I should be able to ask. I show a picture which basically has a selfie of me and a QR code on it. And it basically says, is this person 19? Yes. So the bar can tell it's me and it's only 19. The idea is exactly what you're saying. It should just do verified claims where it needs to, but the barest of minimum. Like Ann Kavukian, I'm on her council for privacy and security by design. Don't let parties ask what they're not supposed to know. So the bar should never be able to ask my health card number or my address or my name or any of that stuff. And it can't in the verified me system. It can only ask things that the rules of the network allow it to ask. And it can be just as simple as you say. It's just a code. It's just a, a QR. I show a picture. Of, it has to be me. It can't be my, um, or it can't be my brothers or sisters sharing IDs to go across. That's to show a face. And then basically, it should just say yes, 19. That's all it should do. And I'm 100% in agreement. Lawrence, Lawrence, the uh, the two problem you're you're raising are, are uh, uh, there's two uh, concept in privacy by design. Uh, one is full functionality. Uh, you should still provide full functionality to the user. Attempt to provide full functionality to the user, uh, if, even if they don't want to share the information. So in the case of Uber, you don't want to share your location, give an address. That's full functionality. It's very easy to, to continue to serve as a customer. Uh, the second thing is what Greg mentioned, data minimization. I don't need to tell you I'm bored in 1970 something to show I'm over 19. There is a concept of zero knowledge. 100%. I should just prove that I'm over 19. We're done. And actually, if you think about digital ID and, and maybe a parallel with payment, payment has been difficult in mobile because people are saying, what's the value add? Is it not faster putting my, 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 my card than putting my mobile? Um, I think with digital ID, we have the opportunity now of doing zero knowledge. Uh, if when I show you my driver's license, you get everything. You get where I live, Correct. you get my eye color, you get everything. With digital ID properly implemented, I could demonstrate to you that I'm over 19 and we're done, or that I'm Canadian, or that I live in Toronto. I don't need to share all this information. Okay. So privacy by design answer a lot of your question, and, and, and they're foundational in, in Canada. And you're 100% right in what you're saying. It should be the bare minimum. So we couldn't agree more. If we don't do that, we haven't done this right. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So, so Second question, single point of failure. Um, yeah. My kids use a picture of me to get into my uh, iPhone through the Face ID. Yeah. So, so, um, and they do this to turn the internet on because I have an app on my phone that turns the internet off. Yeah. So, um, the other thing they do is, you know, they get, they they go and grab my phone when I'm not looking and they shove it in front of my face and then do it. So, uh, yeah. anyway, so the problem there Custom is you can, can log into too. your bank account with that. And you can th also then log into any other service with that. So, um, so it is my mobile phone. Uh, so all someone has to do is take my mobile phone, put it in front of my face, or take it, put it in front of a picture of me, and now they can log into my bank account and effectively transact and do anything on my behalf. And they've logged me into any service, including health records or anything. So I think single point of failure kind of scares me, where the whole thing's relying on a very simple uh, uh, iPhone application, which we know is not very robust. So it's not, it's not as specific as that, but you're 100% right. What are the points of failure in this system? So in that example, they have to have your phone, right? It can't be an app on a different phone. It has to be your phone. Does the facial match work with the iPhone stuff? They can't, you can't put a picture in front of the iPhone to do the facial match. Not on an iPhone. Well, all, good all the reports, well if it's on an iPhone, a picture, a picture shouldn't work. You can, you can break it. Um, but, but the point is they have to have your phone, they have to get through. So the, the ha we have to build into the system all the resiliency to say, okay, if there is a breach and things happen, how do you then track it down? How do you then keep Lawrence Hall? How do you go to those parties and shut it down? And there has to be the resolution mechanisms to do that. But there's lots of factors of authentication. So for example, in this case, if you're creating a verified me account um, at TD, for example, I create the account, I prove that it's me. Then I get an email to me, hey, you just created an account, is it really you? So they're, they're trying to take all the factors here about how do you make sure it's really secure and how do we make sure we're getting to Lawrence to know it's him doing these transactions. Because that's the, the whole bar on this is how do we raise the bar on identity and security. So, Sure, but the, the whole principle of the, the original security is two-factor and it's something you know and something you have. In this case, we've reduced it to you something have. you have because if you've got the iPhone, you get no, it's everything. A, it's, some, it's something that you have and something that you are. In that case, it is your face. Okay, but again, but you're saying, what if they break the face biometric? And so we could say, if we, want more secure, if we want more security, put your face in front and enter your password. Right? So you're not telling your kids your banking password. So we could say on every transaction, do your face and your password. 
the balance here is between where are we having fraud and where do we want to have friction? Because we could say put a piece of hair in and let's do a DNA analysis. <laughs> and I guess that kind of works. But at some point in time, is it good enough for banking? Okay. All of us here, how many use a biometric on their banking app to log in? Uh, are you having fraud on that? We're not having tons of fraud on that. So in, in, if there's an issue there, we basically just turn on and say, OK, from now on, when you're going to share data, enter your password as well. Yeah. Or answer the, the, the whole point of the system is we're really monitoring and trying to make sure people are safe. Like the reputational risk, the reason this took, like I've been in this for 10 years, so this is not overnight, right? 10 years to do identity stuff. The reason it took as long as it took, even with Verified, is all the security around what do we do and how do we raise the bar if we have to raise the bar on these pieces. Because the bad guys are there. They're trying to get money. Like the, you're getting these phone calls that I'm getting that say they're the CRA and I'm going to jail if I don't answer these questions right now. And then the real CRA phones which says, I have a question. And you say, yeah, curse them a little bit. <laughs> bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> so, so um, but it's hard, right? It's hard. So how do you deal with security in the space? It's got to be multi-factor. It's got to be checking the phone. If I'm going to do an out of band to the phone, yeah. was the SIM changed in a period of time? Yeah. So right? ju just to yes. add to that, though, so security is a layered approach, right? Yes, you have facial biometrics. We have behavioral biometrics. There's all kinds of things that happen in the background that can be implemented. There's step up for high value transactions, mm -hmm. something you know that only you know, right? Some institutions have you authenticate five different ways, right? If I call my particular bank and I'm waiting online, like on the phone, they want me to punch in my phone pin, right? That I have to, to communicate with them. So yes, they're trying to do omni-channel and normalize all this, but security is a layered approach. And, and, they're, and, they're, and they keep adding, right? Like some of the companies now are, because they're getting so many attacks for mobile, they're detecting the movement of the phone and is the it's phone on and they're checking that while you're doing it because the attack vectors, they're putting all these phones in racks. I hate to cut and you so off. I can tell they're not moving. So now they're building these racks that move. Yes. All right. I hate to cut you off, but let's <laughs> yeah. try to get uh, yeah. a question yeah. here. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we've been talking a lot this morning about consumer digital identity. What about SME digital identity? Are you seeing any evolution either here locally in Canada or internationally? And what are some of the barriers for that segment? So we're we're seeing huge pull among our partners and friends saying, how do I do for SMEs? Like our we're a small company, SecureKey. We have tons of stuff internally that we have where Susan, who's our CFO, gets emails purportedly from me saying, hey, Susan, can you pay this bill today? And it's a supplier we have, and it isn't their account. So the kind of security they have to identify who someone is when they're making a request is a big one. But also going to a bank. The banks are realizing, hey, if, if SecureKey is applying for a loan and we want a million dollar line of credit, is this really Greg Wolfond at SecureKey who's applying, or is it somebody else? So you see a lot of FIs thinking about how can I use this you know, prove who you are within the context of the company. And we have lots of folks who are doing the company databases and the registry. So you can put those things together. At the end of the day, all this is done by people. Mm -hmm. So is it you? Do you have the control at your company to do that? The longer term of payments is this is all going to go digital. The idea that I sign or someone in my, one of my folks signs an authorization, yes, pay this bill, and then it goes to me to sign this bill so that finance can then write a check in small business to pay stuff is ridiculous, right? If we have proper digital identity, we can know, hey, Greg authorized this. Um, Susan signed it. Do the electronic payment. And we're like, it's ridiculous today in 2019 that we can't do that stuff. But it's because we don't have digital identity. If we can know it's you, you put your face in front and you authorize this piece and then someone else authorizes, we can shut down so much of that workload and get rid of some of the fraud in those processes. It's a journey to get there. But this stuff has huge applicability for small business. Like small business can adopt this for onboarding its customers. But it also, when it's going outbound, wants to be protected about against some of these fraud. Yeah, I guess I'm just looking for what you're what you're seeing in the landscape of anyone that is actively looking to solve for this, again here or or what Vonex. what success you've seen internationally. Vonex.io. Short answer, go see what Vonex.io is doing. It's in BC, British Columbia. It's a public registry that will add information about organization that you'll be able to say, is there such a thing as a TELUS corporation? Is it in good standing right now? When was it registered? Uh, sure. Two second answer, Vonex.io. Sorry, I think what, what was that? Von, V-O-N-X dot I-O. Uh, BC, uh, province of BC led mm -hmm. project that is getting world, uh, world review, great review right now. Thank and, you. But, but your view is it would help, right? So you, as a, for small businesses, this starts to make a difference. We're, we're seeing oh, yeah. so lots of SIs. There's on lots it. of need. Yeah. I'm looking great. for the solve. Okay. All <laughs> okay. right. That's, uh, I think yeah. we have time Thank for you. only one more question. Okay, sure. great. Thanks. Um, it seems like this is a very grassroots uh, sort of solution. I mean, like other countries, Sweden, that kind of stuff, is at the national level. So why are we trying to sort of have all of these 
various groups kind of trying to do verified me and everything, where you're, you may get an adoption rate of a million people out of 35 million. Why isn't it just, why, would the, why wouldn't the national government, you know, the federal government get involved and everybody has an ID for all of Canada and that's what it is and that they can work on the global pieces where our ID, that's for every Canadian, that's... that's I'm sure the yeah. panel will have a lot to say on this too, but from my experience, North America, not just Canada, has had, uh, in fact, all English-speaking nations have had a resistance of top-down government-imposed ID cards. And right, but I, I, I think it's Sweden a is issue. like I think I, if I'm not mistaken, Sweden, I think yes, Sweden. Sweden everybody has yeah. a digital ID and everything is tied to that. Yeah, it's, it's called it's called bank ID. So you basically use your bank and another band off, and you use your banks to do authentication to be able to share. And that's kind of the model that we're very close to here. That your banks are part. We're kind of a generation ahead of that, where we have your bank plus your telco plus matching government ID as well to be able to do this. It's basically modeled on that. And I'd say things like concierge is national driven first. Like 12 million Canadians use the concierge service, more than half the people who sign into CRA use their bank to log in today. Right. That was driven by the federal government to come down here. And the, and the solution around DIAC, where the federal government's participating in DIAC and saying bring solutions, not just one solution, but multiple solutions to help solve this ID problem, is kind of the Canadian way to say it's not just one party. Let's bring a lot of folks to the table to kind of solve it. They, we're not, like, we don't think we'll see in the US, we don't think we'll see in Canada a national ID card like Estonia. Because it's just there's too much big brother and tracking and they have a server now that's tracking where I go and what do I do and people don't want that. But I think you will see that the government is pushing this um, standards kind of approach to get ID to come and have it flourish. The, the uh, Pan-Canadian Trust Framework has been co-authored between uh, private and public sector. Mm -hmm. And in the public sector, you have the federal government, you have a number of provinces. So you will see uh, it is uh, technology agnostic, but really look at what's the, the framework and the operating level of what do we call a trusted credential, what do we call a trusted ID, and, and, and looking at those processes. So I, I, I think, I think the, public sec the pri public sector is doing more than, uh, than, than is visible uh, maybe uh, at, at, at today's presentation. Oh, thanks well, very much. Yeah, my red light is flashing more than Greg's slides, so <laughs> I will have to uh, uh, conclude this panel. I'd like to thank uh, Christian and Pierre and Greg for their participation and the audience for being here. Thank you.